We are sitting here with legendary lawyer, Porsche collector, and now vintage watch collector, Paul Zuckerman. Thank you for sitting with us. My pleasure. Awesome. We wanted to sit and talk with him while we were in town because obviously everybody knows I'm a huge vintage Porsche fan. But what I really find interesting is when I go to a lot of car shows and car meets and talk with a lot of clients, vintage car buyers are typically not vintage watch buyers. And it's really strange. There's not a huge intersection, but you are. And we just sold you an amazing Submariner that was That's like true. my personal one. So I'm like sad to see it again. But I wanted to like hear a little bit of your backstory first, uh, how you got into vintage watches. Like what was your first watch? You know, wh how did you get bit by the bug? Okay, so, and I'm surprised to hear that you say vintage car guys and not vintage watch guys. Now I'm not going all over the country right. like you. The, the guys that I know here with vintage cars are into vintage really? watches, but I'm in a very small cross-section of the population. I don't have your exposure. I, where I got into vintage watches was actually in the late 80s and early 90s. I would go to the jewelry district in New York and pick up a Rolex for 500 bucks. <laughs> the good old days. Right, so I'd get an oyster, I'd get a date, and I had some very interesting early oysters that had interesting bezels, interesting bands, and I had those watches. Right. And I always loved those watches. But as I started to get into business, lawyering, all of my money initially went into the lawyer the business. business. Sure. And cars were always my first love. I always had the car bug. We know. Bad, right? <laughs> but there was always a watch. And over the course of time, there were some vintage Rolexes that I don't know where those old ones went that I got, the three or four that I got in the late 80s, early 90s, because they were so cheap, they were disposable. That's what a lot of people don't think about, you know, because we look at the values of these watches today and we see the record auction prices. But this watch right here, a solid gold vintage Daytona, when this first came out in the 70s or 80s, it was a little bit more than a steel one. A steel one was $250, $300. Right. That one was maybe $1,200, which was a lot of money right. for the time. But compared to what they sell for now, people don't realize that they weren't, Rolex wasn't the brand that it was the, today. It was. not And yeah. so there was a, a Daytona, vintage Daytona that I really agonized over by for five grand in the early 90s in the jewelry district and I couldn't make up my mind that five grand was a lot of money at the right. time and I passed on it and I will say part of my staying away from watches I think was a bit of self-resentment because had I kept those watches and gotten that Daytona I'd be so far ahead of the game. Yeah, you wouldn't appreciate them now. Right. Sometimes if I miss the boat on something, then I just go, F it. let those people have it. Right. Right. And so, but then you know, I, I really got into the cars. And so when I got money, it was the cars. But as I said, there were watches there. There was a, a 5512 lurking around somewhere. There was a GMT, is it 1675? Yeah, we have one that Jordan wanted right, to bring Probably to like a, a, you know, a Pepsi Cola kind right. of a thing. There was a Galet. That, yeah. Uh, there was a Galet that I must have gotten 25 years ago. That's, awesome. That's a chronograph. That's awesome. A See? Flyers watch. So it was always kind of there. there. Yeah. But it was, it was ignored in favor of the cars and if all my friends are talking about something, which all my friends did talk about watches, the truth is I don't want to do what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit of a contrarian. I get it. I think for myself, I, I got started first in watches and then gravitated to cars because I was living out of the country. Right. So cars weren't an option for me. Right. You know, I always grew up loving and admiring cars and obviously driving you know, throughout my childhood and, and college years, but I couldn't dive into stuff like this because right. I was living out of the country for a long time. So I got into watches and that's where it really excelled for me. Now, I have a question for you because you mentioned buying these watches when they were relatively inexpensive. Right. Did you start with buying cars when they were relatively yeah. inexpensive? Did you miss the boat, as you said? I, I missed the boat, but I got on, but I got on the next boat. Right. So that wasn't the first, but I did get I did get some cars at the right price. Right. But I never was really in it for the price, price. of it. The cars are such a passion with me. I don't care all that much about getting the best deal. I want the car that speaks to me, that I'm passionate about, 
that I enjoy whether I make money or lose money. Yeah. It's, and it's the same with watches. I just bought a watch for myself, a modern watch, not even vintage, because I like both, you can right. like both. And I bought it at full blown retail and I know the second I sell that watch, I'm gonna lose money. It's just, right. it's, it's inevitable. But I wanted the watch because I, I, it's not about the money, it's about the passion for the watch right. and the love of the watch. Right, and, and I have a theory and I, there's civilians and there's soldiers. So in both the watch game and the car game, I'm a civilian. Right. So uh, it, me trying to make profit on cars, I'm trying to do be something I'm not. I'm not a soldier. I'm a civilian. I'm a consumer. I don't fool myself into thinking that I'm in the business. Right. That's where people can go wrong. I know if I want to go make money, I want to be in business, I go to the law office. Yeah, exactly. I go where I make money. And what you just said is that there are times you're a civilian where you're right. just going to get a watch for the sake of it. And, and it's really funny you say that because I remember when I started getting into cars and more expensive yeah. cars and collectible cars, another watch dealer friend of mine said, uh, you know, because I was worried about losing money and whatnot, and he was like, listen, our business is to sell watches. We can't sell watches not for a profit because then we have no business. But cars, that's my hobby. So like, right. I fully expect to lose money and that's the cost of ownership mm -hmm. and that's, you know, the enjoyment and I get out of it, that's what it costs me to do that. And he's absolutely right. right. I've lost a fair bit amount of money selling cars, right. uh, but I've enjoyed every second that's of it. That's right, you know? and so. if you were strictly in it for making money, you wouldn't enjoy no. the drive, you wouldn't enjoy the experience, uh, those kind of things. So recently, I won't say I've taken the cars as far as they'll go, right. but I've done enough you with got, the cars. You've got some and incredible I've, stuff. Right, so. <laughs> and, and so I started to think more about the watches. Right. I like what a watch represents. I like what time represents. Time is a very modern concept. Right. Uh, the use of a wrist, wrist watch is a, is a relatively modern concept. Last 120 years. Yes, yeah. and a wrist watch it was really a brand new thing around World War I. Yep. By the way, I have my grandfather's tank watch somewhere. Me too. Uh, yeah. I feel like everybody at some yeah. point inherited from their grandfather right. a Cartier tank. Right. I, so, I got a, I got a, a, a quartz one that's gold plated, but it's still something right. that will never leave my collection because it means so much sentimentally. Right. But everybody has some version everybody of it. Everybody has tank. that. So it, recently I, I have parted with a car and I thought, well, we'll I do with that and I do like the concept of asset for asset like right. if I'm gonna take it out of a car I could squander the money on nothing right. or I could put it into something else and my thinking was instead of replacing it with a car let me go and get some watches that I've deferred a, for a long time let me pay today's prices whatever collecting cycles. cycles and maybe it's in it up it, it's very high still maybe a little bit off of the, the, the maximum, but at the same token, I, I sell a car, I get three watches, and I don't have to have the detailer come once a week, I'm right. not storing them. So it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of fun, and, and watches like cars can have stories. Absolutely. Yeah, and so it can be time travel. Tell us about the watch on your wrist, because I love the fact that you're wearing that. Like, where did you pick that up? Like, what, what drew you to it? Well, here's the thing. I got this from Cameron Barr at Craft & Taylor. Shout out to Craft & Taylor. Yes, of course. and it was a little tutor he had. And honestly, I w it was a gift for somebody. But I'm a pig at times, <laughs> and so, so the watch came, and I was like, and I, and I looked at it, and I go, wow, it's a really nice looking yeah. watch and it really sits nice right. on the wrist and it it feels like a million bucks you yeah, tell me what you it is why? you know better what it is you know why because this is a tudor date model oyster prince the thing with this watch is is that the rolex equivalent of this is the date just right okay? but the date just is 36 millimeters and right. it wears a lot smaller so a lot of men in contemporary time don't like wearing it this is 38 millimeters it has these long you know elongated lugs the case is similar to a milgauss 1019 it's like actually the same case different case back and so it wears more like a contemporary watch and for the price you get to buy these for you know the entry point is way cheaper than a day mm. just and it almost does everything the same you right. know? and it wears better you know so it's a perfect like Jordan was saying earlier it's a perfect daily wearer watch it's not too flashy but it's respectable it's Tudor which is a great brand one of the most popular brands in the world one of the most sold brands in the world and uh, you know, I, I don't know what you paid for it, but I can't imagine it was, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Of course no, not. No, it, so, it was a couple of few grand. Right, exactly. So, and you can't get a, a nice deal JHS for that anymore. Right. You know, they're starting at forty five hundred up for nice examples. And and so yeah, like putting it on this beautiful leather strap, I, it's 
perfect watch. Wear it with a suit. Wear it with you know jeans. You know t-shirt doesn't matter. Right. So. And so it's it's just a it's just a beautiful piece. Nice. And it's you know it's like a man for all seasons, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. So that's that's what I was I'm rocking today. All right. So tell us about the big guy sitting in front of us, though. I know you recently picked this up. Well, I'm huge a, fan of it. Well, let me start with your watch. Sure. Let's start with my watch. You put this watch. It's an early Submariner six five three six slash one. And I was always interested in a non-crown guard sub, an right. early sub. There's so many different variations of an early sub. Mm -hmm. Forget about big crown, small crown. There's right. so many numbers starting, what, 6,200? Right. You could really go down a rabbit oh, hole plenty of, models, of numbers. Yeah. That I, and, and some numbers are lower, higher, out of sequence right. in terms of time. And it's a mystery to me why one number is one number, one number is another number. So when you posted on your Instagram story that it was your personal watch, then I said, okay, if, it's, if this guy made this choice, that's good enough for me. So I bought this watch a year and a half ago in Sotheby's. It was in their online sale. It was property of the original owner. They were supposed to be, they apparently said they still have them. There's pictures of the guy wearing it. Came with the original bracelet that was broken into pieces. I'm eventually gonna, yeah. I was gonna surprise you and eventually get it put back together for you. And when I saw it, I was like, it was hidden in this online catalog. No one was really looking at it. And the case is amazing, the original bevels. The dial's beautiful, it has patina, it's not glossy anymore because these dials were originally factory lacquered or right. glossy. The radium is like eaten away at it and it's given this beautiful patina. The loom is perfect, you know, with this six o'clock marker being a shade lighter because you see only on very few models. And then the original bezel, no hash insert, this bezel is a $30,000 bezel. Wow. Because it goes to certain big crowns also. Now, if you have a quarter million dollar big crown and the bezel is replaced, you'll pay 30 grand for this bezel because it increases the value of your watch and it makes it all original. I feel like I'm on Antiques Roadshow when you say that. So, where I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And the, I can't believe the it. condition of it too, it was just, I, it knocked my socks off and I was able to buy it for a price that I'm like, I can't sell this watch. I know I can make a profit on it the second I want to sell it, but it just, it just spoke to me, you know? And sometimes a watch just has to speak to you and you promise you will sell this back to me. Right. I sold this watch only to pay for the watch I told you, the modern watch right. I bought, which was an MB&F that I've always really wanted. And I have other ones like this in stock that if I get the itch, I can wear it. Right. But this will come back to me one day, yeah. I'm sure. It, it's just, you know, sometimes like there's no rhyme or reason. It's just the watch you see and you're like, I, I love that. And that was it. Yeah. You were holding the flashlight on this for right. me because I couldn't figure that that segment of right. the market or the, or the watch out. Right. Yeah, and, and listen, and the price that you got it for, the market for this watch, has just like some of the Porsches has come down a lot and it's you're buying it at a more reasonable price point at this point because two years ago it would have been double what you paid for it really yeah absolutely well you know so, so sometimes you sometimes you're the dog you know, sometimes you're the tree and it's funny because the antique show last week or two weeks ago and supposed to sit on a panel with hodinky and sotheby's and talk about guild dial rolex one of the questions was guild dial rolex and whether it's buy hold sell and I fortunately, unfortunately got sick and I couldn't attend the panel, but there was a lot of differing opinions and the general consensus was it's a hold opportunity because now while the prices are low, all these collecting cycles are cyclical, you know, right. uh, and it's going to come back to a point where people are like, wait, these 50s Rolex, you know, early 60s stuff is really special watches. Right, it's where it started. It's where it started. And the prices will eventually, in my opinion, go back up. I, who knows when? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? It's but a beautiful watch. It's got beautiful patina. And some of your colleagues have come through my office. The other day, I just happened to have it sitting right. on my desk. I took it off for a moment. It was amongst a bunch of papers on my desk. And, and to, to my surprise, but I shouldn't be surprised, this colleague of yours has watch eyes. Right. He, he said, wait a second, wait a second. What's that on, on your desk? I said, what? And he says, no, 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 that. I see something there. And he grabbed it. <laughs> and he goes, what is this? This is beautiful. This is a really Making nice Making me sad that watch. I sold it. <laughs> yeah, I, you should be. And by the way, did you yeah. notice the original crystal? Yeah. All crazed and everything, yeah. you know, but it's still tight, so it's not going to fog up. Right. But I made sure of that. But, like, I didn't want to change it because right. it's just this original crystal from 1956, right. still intact. So it's a winner. Enjoy it. It's a winner. For the now. For, for now, the now. Until you sell it back to me. All right, tell us about the last watch. And again, I know you're busy. We'll let you get back to lawyering. Uh, right. A profession I left a while ago, but you yeah. still love well, it. Well, this, so. is, this is just one of those things that just, it's kind of a grail watch. Absolutely. It's a special watch. It's gold. It's not an everyday watch. But some, if you have the ability to grab the, the 
the grail piece when it comes in. It's a, it's a six two six five yep. sourced from the original owner. Right. It's in beautiful condition. Box papers, it seems. And it has everything. It has everything. Wow. And I love how the there's a little bit of wear on this. Yeah. Always. On, yeah. on this from the box, and you open it up, and I think somewhere in there I've got. The original extra links that yeah, were they probably put it in the back yeah, yeah. oh there's here's the, the original pins it looks like wow i always laugh i say you, it, the owner like this you never want to live with this person you get them in cars too but you want to buy from them yeah go they're probably a nightmare to, to live with you know it's just such a perfection yeah and the condition is absolutely beautiful stunning dial stunning patina perfect plots like really really nice i i know who you got it from and i remember seeing him wear it i'm like oh what's that you know and he's like, oh, we just picked it up. He was so excited. And I took a look at the watch and I was like, yeah, it's a beautiful watch. And yeah. a lot of people don't understand because uh, new collectors to vintage Rolex specifically always ask box and papers, box and papers. It's not important. And they, it's not important. It is, but it's yeah. not. But they don't realize how few of these watches are left over with box and papers because like we were talking about earlier, yeah. these watches were a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, and get thrown in the 50, 60 years ago when people changed houses or whatever, they didn't think these were gonna appreciate in value. Right. They, they tossed out the box and papers or the warranty was only good for a year, so why do they need to keep it, you know? And, and to find these watches with everything, you right. original appraisal right. and with 1981. With typed on a typewriter. Yeah. That's what I what I like was the typed on the typewriter and the refer, reference to it as a gents Always. watch. Gents. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, gents. So this is November 7th, 1981. The appraisal from Mayers was $6,000, $59.50. And <laughs> and that's what he purchased it yeah, for. Absolutely. And I think there's an Amex receipt in here. So yeah, the the, the fact is, well, uh, I think you would agree that the priority is a, a good example, and that this is the icing on the cake. Yeah. All of all of the tissue that comes with it. My personal collecting, I don't look out for watches with box and papers. I like, the, for example, right. I, I will buy any watch. It just depends on the condition and the originality of the watch. If it has box and papers, it's a certainly a bonus, right. and it's a reflection of the price. But I'm not seeking it out. Right. You know, I'm happy if it has it, but it's not like a deal breaker right. if it doesn't. So yeah, congrats. Well, on this this, this, this takes me back because this is my uh, November of '81. I was in 11th grade. Okay. Right. I'm in high school. Right. The idea that people had watches like this there was no i didn't know gold watches existed, existed yeah. on november 7th of 1981 <laughs> i didn't know i do know like this kind of a you know a receipt with amex where they they used to smash the card and the, and the yeah, thing they pulled across. across so i'm not it, even that old that i i forgot about that when yeah I was young. I, so they still did that all of <laughs> all of this is time travel for me i think about it I go okay my dad was still alive in 81 right. he was still you know relatively healthy you, you can go back to i can think okay it was a little after reagan got shot right it was uh, it was the beginning of the go-go 80s right yuppie years we were just coming out of a recession and it and and it was just about to, you know, the world was about to take off. The, right. the, the, the kind of modern world was about to start. Yeah, it's, an, it's a watch of a bygone era, and it represents like a, a, a very special moment in time. You know, yeah. it's really what it is. And the watch is beautiful, so you get to wear it and enjoy it anyways. You know, yeah. so congrats on this one. Beautiful watch. I'm jealous. Well, thank you. I, I, and you know what? It's funny because like I can't wear a lot of solid gold watches unless it's on a leather strap. But this specific watch, the 66 Five and Gold, is the only one that I will do it with. Really? For some reason, I don't know why. Let it's me put it one. on because sometimes I'm a little reticent to wear a solid gold watch. Like it's just a little bit too much. As if I'm not a little bit too much right. to begin with. But as I, as you wear it. Right. It's kind of like uh, somebody told me though recently. I said I told them like I've sometimes I'm hesitant to wear solid gold watches, and they're like that's main character syndrome. That means you you you're worried. No one else right. cares what you're wearing. You're you're self conscious, right. but no one else cares. Exactly. You know? so, exactly. I, I, I and actually then, thought about it. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to start giving it more of a try. Right. And when you wear it after a while, it becomes kind of like Gollum in the ring. My precious. My precious. Right. <laughs> once you start, once you get over that right. self consciousness about it. Right. You want to put it on. Yeah. Yeah. You want to put it on, and then you, listen. Yeah. For you, it's a testament to your hard work, the amazing business that you've built, you know, and and you're collecting throughout the years, you know, like rewarding yourself for getting your grail. Like you said, that was right. a grail, you know, and right. it's not that easy to find, and it's not that easy to pull the trigger on, and you know, it's it just goes to show, you know. It is easy to pull the trigger on. <laughs> There's only, yeah, I'm going to say to everybody, if you're wondering, the last two words you say to yourself are, "Fuck it, fuck it." It should be your motto. This is all so short and so transitory. 
right? Yeah. We're only if here you, for a short if time. If you want it, f it. What's the worst thing that happens? I sell it, I lose a little bit of money. Yeah. Okay, move on, I'll forget. That should be the title of this episode. The last two words I've ever said before, any horrendous, horrible decision or any great decision. It. There you go. Well, that being said, it. thank you so much it. for sitting down with us. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Really hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. If you like this content, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, anything you could always do to help us grow the channel. And we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Bye. Oh, see, did you get wide woods, have you? Can you move the chair just a little bit? Is yeah. towards you? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Am I sitting like an ape with my legs <laughs> open, or or do I look like a human? However you like. I'm right. If you're sitting like this. <laughs> <laughs>